excited about what God's going to be speaking through this new series. That last song that you guys uh, sung, the Sea of Victory song, is sort of an inspiration for this particular sermon series. We almost didn't sing that song because the song was, um, you know, when they bootleg the song and they like somebody screenshots it and then they, they put it on YouTube. Y'all don't know about that, right? Y'all say it. But, you know, some people I know in my family, you know, they sometimes kind of like screenshot stuff and then they, they put it on YouTube and try to get the credit for it. So they had it on like that and I was excited about it. And then all of a sudden we went to go play the song, but the link was removed. And we we're like, oh, man, we're going to be able to sing the song. And then thank Jesus for IG because we were watching IG and uh Elevation posted that it was coming on soon, Thursday, so I was like, okay, cool, it's coming out soon. But the next day, I get the notification that they released the song, and so we were ecstatic to know that and uh, to be able to sing that song, because I believe that it's not just a song, it's a prophetic declaration. We're saying that no matter what battle we might be going through, no matter how long we've been going through, there's going to come a day when God's going to turn it. He's going to take everything that the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good. Hallelujah. All right, let's get into the Bible because I'm, I'm getting excited. Um, I'm going to ask you to go to Romans chapter 8. And this is kind of like the, the theme sort of verse for the whole series. You ever watch a series on Netflix and there's always like a theme no matter what episode you're on? Nobody here watches Netflix, thank God. I'm the only heathen in this place. Lord, save me. If you respond to me, I'll know that you know that I know what I'm talking about, okay? Earlier this week, I actually shared this verse with somebody. It was so good, I, I had to share it back to myself. You ever do that? You buy something for somebody and then all of a sudden, I gotta I got get me one of those. So I shared this verse with somebody this week. I wanted to encourage somebody. I'm like, this encouraged me. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. But I want you, if you have your Bible apps, I want you to go to the Passion Translation. It says like this. It says, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together. Isn't that good right there? Every detail of our lives is woven together. In other words, the stuff that goes on in your life sometimes that doesn't make sense, Paul is saying here, it's woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. Father, we thank you for your word. We know it's alive and well, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, to pierce our hearts, Lord. We ask you, Lord God, to open our minds that we might be able to receive, Lord God, what you're going to deposit. If there's sickness in this place right now, we speak healing, Lord God. If there's somebody captive in their minds and caught up in their emotions, Lord God, right now we speak the spirit of peace in Jesus' name. Come on, give him a shout of praise. And so from there, we're going to go into one more scripture. Is, is that okay? This one's in 2 Kings chapter 7. This is sort of like our story. This is our plot, all right? This is where we're working from, all right? It says like this in, in chapter 7, and I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit and not read all of it all together, but I'll read some of it and bounce around. It says, Elijah replied, listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley will cost only one piece of silver. 
For those of you that do not know ancient biblical economy, what he's saying is that this time tomorrow, there is going to be so much overflow that you can walk into the BMW dealership and pick up your five series, right? And it's going to cost you like a $50 monthly payment to do so. This is what he's trying to say here. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, and, and every time God gives you a word of blessing, there will always be an opposition to that word. There will be always somebody who's not going to believe. So you got to be careful who you surround yourself with. It says that the, the officer assisting the king said to the man of God that that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. Come on, tell me if the devil's not a liar. But Elisha replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. You won't be able to eat. Now, verse 3 confuses me a little bit because we go from the prophet bringing a word of prosperity to the people of Israel, a, a word of breakthrough and victory. And then all of a sudden, it goes to these four men. It says, now there were four men with leprosy. What do four men with leprosy have to do with the breakthrough that Israel has? See what I read earlier, Romans 8, 28? It says that everything is woven together in other words one thing that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the other sometimes the things that seem weak and and the things that don't seem like they can help out your situation God will weave it together with the strong stuff God is using every single aspect of your life to work out his purpose and his plan in your life and so this is now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gate and they said like this, why should we sit here waiting to die, they asked each other. We will starve if we stay here, but with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well, somebody said we might as well, go out and surrender to the Iranian army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans, but when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sounds of a great army approaching. And the, they said like this, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us. They cried to one another, so they panicked and ran into the night, abandoning their tents, their horses, their donkeys, everything else as they fled for their lives. And when the men with leprosy arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into the tent after another, eating and drinking wine. And if and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. Tell somebody you've got to share it. If we wait until the morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. And so I'm, I'm going to leave it there for now. I'm going to leave it there for now. I probably should have read the chapter before because this kind of doesn't make sense without me telling you the backdrop for this. What's going on right now in Israel is that the city is being sieged. In other words, the city was completely surrounded by the enemy to the point that nothing came into the city and nothing went out of the city. And what that means is that they weren't able to trade any goods. People weren't able to buy any food. They were starving to the point, it says, that women began to eat their children. That's how bad it got. That's how bad the siege was. And so there was a great famine going on. Not because there wasn't enough rain or because there wasn't enough crops or because there wasn't enough livestock. It's because they didn't have access to the very thing that they possessed. Because they were surrounded. And sometimes when the enemy can't stop the blessing in your life, sometimes he'll cut off the access to it. And I believe that God wants to reconnect us to some things that the enemy has tried to lay siege of. 
and keep us in bondage. And so, um, again, the prophet says, by this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost only one piece of silver, and 12 quarts of barley will cost only one piece of silver. And so, the prophet makes that declaration, but once the prophet makes the declaration, the man who is assisting the king says, that can't happen. Not even if God opened the windows of heaven. And whenever God speaks a word over your life, you have to always be careful who you have around you. Because it's the people around you sometimes that will try to hold up or detain the blessing. It will sometimes be the people closest to you that will become in opposition of what God has already declared over your life. And so we can't go based on what we see in the natural, we've got to go based on what God is showing us in the spiritual. Which means that we need to have more than just sight. See, sight is the power or the faculty of seeing. It's the perception of being able to observe objects. But vision is the ability to conceive. In other words, I can have my eyes closed and still have vision. Because I'm seeing it in the spiritual realm. Matthew chapter 10 verse 41 says, The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. In other words, when we receive the prophetic word that God gives us, our reward is the fulfillment of that word. That is the reward. And sometimes there are people that will see the blessing from afar but never partake of it. Because they're constantly declaring all types of negativity over their lives. They're constantly declaring the obvious, what they see in the natural. And a lot of times we allow those declarations to become our life anthems. In other words, we, 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 we allow sometimes a small season of sickness to become our anthem. We, we allow a period of maybe um, certain sadness or depression that we might be going through to be sort of our anthem. And so we've got to be able to be like eagles. We need to soar above sometimes. We need to soar above the present situations to see what God has ahead of us. Right now, I believe that as a nation, we need to soar above. Because a lot of us have our eyes down here. And people right now are debating whether they should go to Target or Walmart. Because they're not sure what's going to happen when you walk in. Because our eyes are caught up here. But I, but I believe that even in the midst of the turmoil that we're seeing in, the, in our nation, that God is preparing a powerful move of his spirit. He is lifting up a people that are not going based on what they see down here, but people who are flying above and saying God is weaving things together. He's weaving hatred. He's weaving, you know, uh, prejudices. He's, he's weaving, you know, social inequalities. He's weaving it all together to work things out. He's allowing that to happen. So now, so now that, that in, 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 and not that God desires, I don't want you to think this at all. God does not desire calamity to happen. That is not God's desire. That is sin that has entered. And when sin entered into man, we, we entered into a state of brokenness. And this is why people do what they do. It's not that God desires it. But God will take what the enemy meant for evil. He'll turn it for our good. And I believe that what is going on right now, God is going to use that weapon of mass destruction of how he's, and when I'm talking about the weapon, I'm just talking about a gun. I'm talking about the distorted minds that he's created and, and, and broken hearts. This is not about having, I, I, I'm, I, sometimes I need to be careful when I talk about these things because people think I'm trying to be political and I'm not trying to be political. What I'm trying to be able to do is open your eyes to a spiritual truth. Alright? The problem 
this nation has is more than physical weapons. Look at what the Bible says. It says that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities that move in the atmosphere. When we talk about principalities, we're talking about uh, things that move in the spirit. Come on. How many believe that there's spiritual forces? You believe in Bluetooth. Bluetooth, there's no wires there. You don't see Bluetooth working, but you know it works because there's a connection. When you turn on your phone and you place play in your car, the, you hear it on the speaker, right? So if we can believe in Bluetooth and we can believe in Wi-Fi, we can definitely believe that there's spiritual principalities that operate in certain regions. And there's a reason why the enemy is attacking our nation, because he knows the potential that lies in our nation. We are one of the most diverse nations in the world. We're talking about the weaving of hundreds of different people from different nationalities, different backgrounds, different colors, coming together to do life. And the enemy does not desire for people to be in unity. And so he wants to bring forth destruction. But I believe that in the midst of this destruction, God's going to turn it to be able to fulfill his promises. He says in his word that in the last days, I shall pour my spirit on all flesh. Right. So you will see dreams, you will see visions, you will prophesy. And so I believe that that time is coming. And so we can't get caught up in what we see in the right now. We can't be like this assistant who was like, even if God opened the windows of heaven, that's no way that could happen. And so, I believe that there are people here right now living in the midst of a spiritual famine because sometimes the enemy prepares weapons against us. But if we decide to agree with the prophetic word of God, I believe that God is about to turn. He is the Lord of the 180. Yes, amen. He's not just the God of the 360. See, sometimes we do 360s and go like this. And we end up in the same place where we started. Right. That's what happened to the people of Israel. He said, he, they, he took them out. He, he said, I'm going to bring you to, to the promised land. And it was only a three-day journey. 40 years, they were like this. Doing 360s, 720s, and 360, just going round and round and round. And sometimes that's how we live our lives. We start good, but then all of a sudden, we just go right back to our own tendencies. But I believe that God wants to do a 180. To do a 180 is to change direction. To do a turn that changes the direction of our lives. I believe he's about to change the direction of some of our lives as we remain faithful to the promises that he's given us, as we, remain, as we remain faithful to the resources that he's given us. And so he says, the prophet says, in about this time tomorrow, in other words, it's going to be a 24-hour turnaround. And if we do exactly what God is asking us to do, I believe he will heal our nation. If we turn away from our wicked ways, in other words, if we turn away from, from, from seeking other gods, and when I say other gods, I'm not just talking about statues and idols. I'm talking about other things that take away our affection from the Father. And it's oftentimes in the midst of the greatest despair and impossibility that God works out his greatest miracle. His greatest miracle. My son Christian said something to us that stirred up our hearts that we didn't even have a, a way to answer him. You know, we heard the news that had happened in that Saturday night. He had said, Mom, can we make sure that my friends are prepared so when the Lord comes in? Vanessa was like, what do you mean be prepared? Why, why are you so worried about your friends? He goes, because nothing at this point can happen. The only thing that can happen is for the Lord to come for his church. A 12-year-old being able to have the insight. And, and that's good insight, but, but remember this. We cannot live with the mindset of, okay, we can't do anything about it, so we might as well wait for God to come and, and get us. 
We are not, we don't have an escape plan. In other words, he's not, he's not trying to get us, try, trying to save us from this place. He's planted us here to save what was broken. And I know the world is not going to be perfect when he comes, but I believe that he's called the church to bring forth transformation. That wherever the church is, this one specifically, there needs to be restoration. Wherever this church is and there's brokenness, there needs to be healing. There needs to be restoration. And so um, God is calling us to fly higher, to go above and beyond. Again, there were four lepers who by default remained on the outside. And the reason they remained on the outside, just in case you didn't know, Leprosy was considered one of those diseases that were considered you were considered to be unclean, and so you were away from the regular people. You were you were you were an outcast. You were a reject. You were despised, and so they hung out on the street corner. And so they were on the outside. They remained there because they were really not allowed to enter into the city because of their condition. Their condition did not allow them to be inside the city walls. And sometimes there are people in our lives that's, and sometimes situations that cause us to be on the outside. But I love these guys because although they had a condition that kept them on the outside, and although they were almost to the point of death, they didn't give up. I'm imagining to myself that this is probably one of the worst days of their life. In other words, the day started as being one of the worst days of their life. Sometimes when God's about to turn it, you can't even sense it. You can't even see it. And they got up that morning probably thinking, this is probably the end. Okay? This is probably the end. But one, somebody in that group said, I'm not going to stay silent. We're going to do something about this. So the first thing for God to turn it in your life is you cannot remain silent. you got to be able to speak the goodness of God over your life. You've got to be able to declare the promises of God over your life. And so we have to recognize that silence is your greatest adversary sometimes. Silence can be your greatest adversary. A lot of times people are going through different sort of mental and emotional distress. And rather than bringing it out to the Lord, they just keep it inside. They keep it bottled up and they put on this mask like everything's good, everything's fine, everything's good, everything's fine. But there's something bubbling on the inside that needs to come out. So sometimes our greatest adversary is silence. And God doesn't want us to remain idle. He does not want us to remain idle when he's already prepared the victory for us. Psalms 30 says like this, in verse 11 and 12, it says, You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. So God oftentimes will use any person, regardless of their condition, who is willing to speak life. Sometimes all we have to be willing to do is to speak life. And what's amazing about the greatest turnarounds that God has for us is that they come from the least expected. These guys were the last ones that you could count on to be the deliverers of the people of Israel. They were the people who everybody shunned. They were the guys that when you seen them from afar, you went uh, opposite direction because you did not want to catch leprosy. They were the least ones to be used. And so it, it says here in 1 Corinthians, it says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God will use what we perceive unusable to do his greatest turnaround 
And maybe you might think that the situation you might be going through is unusable. But God says, I'm going to use the weak stuff. I'm going to use the stuff that you even maybe consider to be shameful. I'm going to use it for my glory and for my honor. Because I will take the foolish in the world to shame the wise. I will choose the weak in order to shame the strong. So the first thing we need to do is not remain silent. The second thing we need to do is don't stay still. Don't stay still. Look, it says in verse 3, it says, Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance. Why should we sit here waiting to die? The first thing they did was spoke. The second thing, we will starve if we stay here, but with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Iranian army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyways. would have died anyways. So we're going to take action. We're going to move forward. And, and people who experience a turnaround are those that are willing to move. Not people who are just waiting for something to happen. Not people who are hoping something might happen. Not people who are wishing something might happen. But people who move. People who understand this might cost me my life, but if I stay here, I'm going to die anyways. Right. This, uh, leaving this job might cost me financially, but if I stay here, nothing's going to happen. Leaving this re broken relationship is going to hurt me on the short term, but at least if I move, I'm going to see the mercy of God. And that's exactly what they did. They moved on the basis of mercy. They moved on the basis of mer mercy. And sometimes you never know how God is going to turn things around. You, you never know, which means that you need to look forward to every single day that God gives you. Because every single day that God gives you can be an opportunity for God to give you breakthrough. This is why taking your own life is not an option. This is why walking away from your dreams is not an option. This is why giving up on those kids is not an option. Because every day that God gives you is an opportunity for his mercies to come through in your life. And sometimes it might be a day that it appears that God's not going to do something, but I'm still going to move. I'm not going to stay still. I'm not going to stay here and die where I'm at. I'm going to move to where God is calling me. I'm going to move in the direction in which God has called me. And here's the thing, that, that sometimes when God is leading you and guiding you, sometimes it's just an impression Sometimes you might not even hear his voice. His voice might not even be that audible, but it just might be a hunch. It might just be an impression that God gives you in, a, in your heart to say, you know what? You need to do this, Ernie. You need to do this. You, you can't stay here. You've got to move. And we, if we stay here, we're just going to die. But if we get up and we move, we might be able to receive the mercy of these people. Yes, there's a possibility that we might die, but if we stay here, we're going to die anyway, so we might as well move. We might as well move. Sometimes we miss an opportunity for God's breakthrough and God's miracles because we move and we plan according to what we sense in the natural. According to what we see in the natural. One thing you need to learn about faith is faith is what you do in spite of what you don't sense. Sometimes I'm not going to feel it in my bones. Sometimes I'm not going to feel it. My, my hairs might not even stand up. But that's what faith is about. It's about moving even when I don't feel it. Even when I don't feel it. When we first came to the, when we had the opportunity to come to this building. We were in a, an adult day health center. And we were comfortable there. We were comfortable there. I owned the building, so I, there was really not much rent we had to pay as a church. 
And we had the opportunity to come to this building about 12 months ago. And when we seen the opportunity, we were like, wow, we cannot pay for that building. Besides all the work that we need to get or to do, all the chairs we have to buy, all the furniture we have to get, all these different things, we could have stayed there. We were comfortable there. But something in our spirit, in the leadership spirit, said, you know what? We need to move. We can't sense it, but this is God. This is God. Even though it doesn't seem like we have the finances available, we don't have the... We're going to move. And as we moved, the finances began to appear. They just began to come in. I'm, I'm serious. I'm telling you. They just began. It just God began to... I was in real estate for about 15 years, and God opened up an opportunity for me. I never had done a $1.5 million transaction before. And once we did that, once we said we were going to do this, the Lord opened the opportunity for that transaction to happen. And I said, I'm going to take out close to half, more than half of it, and I'm going to give it to the Lord because I believe that God's going to bless me another way. And God just started touching people to give. And all of a sudden, we got in here. When we got in here, we didn't even know how we were going to pay the rent. But all of a sudden, the overflow started coming in because that's how God moves. God, God will move when you move. Look at what happened here. It says that when the, when the four lepers started walking in the direction the Bible doesn't exactly say this, but I, by, I, can, I can infer from what I'm reading here that this is what happened. Because there's a part here that I read, and I don't know if you, if you took a mental note of it, but it says that the Arameans heard the clatter of chariots. They heard like a war of chariots. They got scared because they said, oh my God, Israel must have hired the Hittites and the Egyptian army. And they're coming, they're coming. And, and they heard all the noise. They, they went in such a panic. It says that they left their horses. They left their donkeys. They left their money. They left their phones. They left everything behind. They just ran in a panic because they thought that the people of Israel were coming deep. And they said, we cannot come against them. And they ran. They left the whole camp. And I believe that the moment that the lepers decided to take that first step, Towards the direction of the camp of the Arameans, God began to create this noise, this just loud shatter that these people had to run. And that's how God operates sometimes. The moment that you move in the direction he's calling you to move, God begins to sh scatter your enemies. He begins to, to scatter the impossible things that have been surrounding you as you begin to take that first step of faith. And so it says that everything that the prophet said came to pass in just one thing, in just one day, just because these men were willing to, number one, speak life, and number two, they were willing to act. My question to you today is, are you willing to speak life? Not come in agreement with your coworker who's going to talk all the crazy tragedies and how things are going from bad to worse but begin to speak life and begin to act on it are we simply waiting around or are we saying you know what I'm going to declare the goodness of God I'm going to declare the goodness of God and maybe I might not have a lot of reasons but the fact that he's giving me two feet and he's giving me the breath to breathe this morning, that's that's just one reason for me to worship God. It was somebody who did not get up this morning. Somebody went to sleep yesterday and they didn't get up this morning. Somebody was hanging out with the family yesterday and today somebody's mourning them. But the fact that the Lord has given me breath this morning is because he still has a purpose in my life. It's because there's some stuff that he still hasn't finished in my life. So therefore, I'm not going to declare what he hasn't done. I'm going to declare what he's about to do. So number one, we need to speak life. Number two, we need to act. 
And number three, we need to reciprocate. Reciprocate. Number three, we need to reciprocate. Look at what it says here in verse 8. It says, when the men with leprosy arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into the tent after one after another, eating and drinking wine. In other words, they were partying. And they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. Finally, they said to each other, hold on a second, guys. This is not right. This is not right. We, we, you know, I know these guys rejected us. I know they despised us. I know they had us on the outskirts of the city, but this is not right. I mean, we're, we're, we're not just going to sit here and take pictures all day on IG so they can see us. We're, we got the gold, we got the silver, we got the bling bling. No. See, sometimes we think that God blesses us so we can flaunt it to our enemies. That's not why God blesses you. See, um, Jesus tells us, he says, in Luke 6, 28, he says, bless those who curse you. We, we follow a different model, you know? Instead of finding opportunities to flaunt to, to those who reject us and those who didn't accept us, we find opportunities to bless those who rejected us and those who despise us. We follow a different model. Somebody say the Jesus model. We follow the Jesus model. So he says, bless those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. In other words, God has blessed you because he wants you to be a vessel. He wants you to carry the blessing, not so you can flaunt it and you can show people how God turned your life around. And God, how God did a 180, he is using you, he's restoring you as a vessel so then you can pour into somebody else's life. Who can then pour into somebody else's life. Who can then pour into somebody else's life. And then whatever the enemy meant for evil, God begins to turn it for my good. But I've got to be willing to reciprocate. In other words, when I say reciprocate, when God gives, we need to be able to be willing to release. When God gives me overflow, I need to release some of that overflow. When God gives me hope, when God gives me joy, I need to release that joy. When God gives me peace, I need to release that peace. When God makes me righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross, I've got to also be able to share that righteousness. It's not now for me, now that God has made me righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross, for me to be like, oh yeah, you know, you need to get it together and you know that, you know, um, you're going to hell and this and this and that. And it's not for me to sit here and condemn people. It's for me to bring God, people in relationship to the Father. Yeah. It's about me becoming a bridge. So that someone can cross over from hopelessness to hope, from darkness to light. Let us be on our feet. I've got to learn to reciprocate. I've got to learn to give back. that day, those men didn't wake up thinking that they would be the key to the turnaround that Israel needed. And maybe you didn't wake up this morning thinking that your faithfulness just to show up here was actually going to move the hand of God. Yeah, I believe that, that that's exactly what's happened to many of you today here. That your faithfulness to come here today, even though maybe you were like, well, I came to church and nothing happened, or I've been coming every day, every Sunday to church and nothing has happened. But your faithfulness to continue to honor what God has called you to do is going to cause a shift. 
And it's going to be an all of a sudden shift because for what happened in Israel, it wasn't a gradual thing. It says that the prophet said it was 24 hours. Boom. The lepers said, this is not right. We've got to share this with somebody else. And they ran back to where the city officials were and they told them what was going on. And it says the king didn't even believe it because he says, I think they're hiding in the fields somewhere of the enemies and they're waiting for us to come out so they can come and destroy us. Send some scouts out. They sent some scouts out and they went to see that it was real. Because that's how faithless people operate sometimes. They've got to be able to see it with their own eyes. They have a hard time walking and living by faith. And it says that when they came back, they found all the loot. They, they found all the gold and the silver and they brought it back. And it says that there was a complete shift. A whole 180 degree turn happened in Samaria where they were living in so much lack and so much famine. In one day, they were living in a complete overflow. Because some men who were despised and rejected decided we're not going to stay here. We're going to move on. And if you believe today that God can shift it in just a moment just asking God, Lord, give me a steadfast heart to be faithful for what you called me to do. I just want a steadfast heart, regardless of what I see or what I sense in the natural. If that's you, just raise your hand. I believe that you are the God who turns things around. I believe that you will use whatever situation I maybe have gotten myself in. Sometimes we get ourselves in believe that you'll even use that to turn it around on my behalf. So Father, right now I just pray over your people, Lord God. We believe that you are the God of the turnaround, Lord. And we believe, Lord God, that you are turning it every situation in our favor, Lord God. The broken marriage, the negative health report, we believe, Lord God, that you are turning those things on our behalf, Lord. That you're turning those things. That maybe, Lord God, even though the enemy meant it for evil, you're going to use it to draw us to you, Lord God. So right now, Lord God, if we're, is there anybody here, Lord God, going through sickness, Lord? Right now we speak healing, Lord. If there's somebody who's captive in their mind, we speak the spirit of freedom right now. 